This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Sign up at the link in the description and also get a free subscription to my streaming service, Nebula. Previously on Patrick H. Willems. I can't take any more of this, man. I'm, I'm leaving. Chloe is going to be our new cast member. Maybe something happened to Pat while he was on that vacation. This is Charles. Charles is alive and he is evil. Can you make that happen? Is this a joke? So have the arrangements been made, as I asked? What? I can't hear you. You said you could do it. It's the only thing I asked for. Now one more time, can you get me into the MTV Movie Awards after party? Look, when I started representing YouTubers, I knew that I was in for some diva bullshit. But I thought it was gonna be things like a bowl full of blue M&Ms in your dressing room or a polar bear rug in every room. This? Patrick, this? It's not happening. And it's not that it's not happening because I couldn't make it happen. Frankly, I'm great at my job. It's not happening because it didn't happen. Because the pandemic. There was no MTV Movie Awards after party this year. They already did the show and it barely happened. It was this weird live stream clip show thing that they did remotely and it was all uh, like Lifetime Achievement Awards. It had nothing to do with you. It wasn't personal. It's not like they didn't approve of your IMDb star meter ranking. What was that word you said? Star meter. Yeah, the thing on IMDb, it tells you how famous you are. It was a joke. Nobody actually cares about that. Can you say all of that again, but sing it? No. I have to go. Dave, there's a polar bear rug salesman for you on line two. Maurice, you better have some good news for me. Thank you both for coming. I hope you're doing well. You see, I have something on my mind. I just did some thinking, and I can't wait to tell the two of you about my latest find. I also have some ideas we could possibly try. Pedro Pascal, Elizabeth Debicki. What? Do the two of them have in common? I think I might know this. They are both film actors. Was Pedro in that Peter Rabbit film? No, man. I'm gonna have to try a new approach. You know I have been searching for ways to build our thrillums. Can one really put a number on you and me? Like subscriber count? So I did some Google searching for Patrick H. Willems. That's when I found myself on IMDb. Why am I scared all of a sudden? Star meter, star meter. It's my ticket to the top, baby, wait and see. Star meter. Take the seat. The star meter lives on IMDb. It shows every actor's popularity. And if I want all my dreams to come true, who needs to get to the top? By Patrick, that's you! Star, star meter, meter! Star meter! My star's gonna rise as the numbers go down. It'll be no surprise when you're wearing the crown. It's like a game of golf with much more at stake. I think you're starting to get it. That's right, Jake. Get on that star meter, star meter. All you gotta do is keep that chart. Star meter, star meter. Okay, so what's the plan and when do we start? Charl is the key to our success. Charl is the key to our success. Charl is the key to our success. Charl is the key Wait, to our how? success. We're gonna make the best videos to raise our scores. All, All of our scores will rise. Patrick, your score's gonna blow the roof. And this plan is bulletproof. Oh, 
cravings of a crazy fan. No one really cares about the star meter. Star meter. Patrick, what the hell has he done to you, Pat? I don't recognize this new. And the first step to get our star meters to the top, we make a video about the movie about the greatest star of all, The Greatest Showman. We finally answer the question, what's up with it? What's up with it? That's your whole take? Do you think it's good? Not really. Do you think it's bad? Not necessarily. So it's just weird? Exactly. And we need to figure out... What's up with it? I guess the videos have been getting pretty long lately. We could use an easy one. Oh, Jake, you sweet, beautiful boy. This won't be easy at all. So why did I suddenly decide to talk about The Greatest Showman? <laughs> well, the truth is, this isn't sudden at all. This movie has haunted me for over a year, and now it's time to do something about it. In 2019, friend of the show Kendra James finally forced me to sit down and watch the circus musical. This momentous event was documented by several people in the room. At the start, I looked like this. You could say I was not super into it. And then, drinking five margaritas over the next 90 minutes, my mood shifted. I don't know how much of it was due to the alcohol, probably a lot, but the movie beat me into submission. Do you wanna go? Do you wanna go? In the end, I couldn't help but wonder, maybe this really was the greatest show. This is the greatest show. Rewatching The Greatest Showman this week, sober this time, I ended up taking five full pages of notes. And this thing is even stranger than I remembered. In 97 minutes, there is enough plot for three movies. I counted at least four central themes. It is the first feature film from Michael Gracie, a director best known for directing a TV commercial in which Hugh Jackman dances, and the entire thing feels like a very long commercial for itself. It has six editors, the same number as Transformers The Last Night, which is the most confusing, least coherent movie ever made. It is a movie where every 15 minutes feels like it's the climactic scene. It is exhausting and bizarre and also one of the most unlikely success stories in 21st century Hollywood cinema. The Greatest Showman opened the week of Christmas 2017. In current times, the general box office trajectory for a major studio release is to have a big opening weekend after which it drops off sharply and is usually gone from theaters after about a month. It's the movie equivalent of how at Christmas we all talk about trying to be better people, but by February we're back to being our regular old garbage selves. The Greatest Showman, which cost $84 million, opened in fourth place in its opening weekend, making only $8 million. It looked like it was a flop. Then the following week, it stayed at number four, but made 15 million. And then it stayed at number four for two more weeks. And then it stuck around in the top 10 until March 2018, grossing a total of $174 million domestic and $437 million worldwide. In box office analysis, there's a term called a multiplier, which is a means of measuring what kind of legs a movie has. To figure it out, you just divide a movie's total box office by its opening weekend box office. Most blockbusters from the past few years, like Avengers Endgame or The Lion King or any Star Wars movie, have multipliers around 2.8, meaning the movies made around a third of their total box office in that opening weekend. The Greatest Showman's multiplier is 19.7. That is, Quite a pair of gams. Legs, getaway sticks. The kind we have not seen since Titanic. So what does all this dumb box office jargon mean anyway? This is the greatest show! 
Well, a lower multiplier is more reflective of a movie's marketing campaign than what people actually thought of it. It means the studio built hype, and then most people saw it that first weekend. But a multiplier like The Greatest Showman had is a reflection of word of mouth. It means people had a good time, and they told their friends, and they went back to see it again and again. It means that people fucking loved this movie. So let's talk to one of them. So I fucking hated it the first time. It was terrible. I went in stone cold sober the first time. And I don't know why I did that. Um, but it was a choice that I made. And went in, sat through this movie. My entire experience with this movie was just very confused. I just didn't understand what it was or what it wanted to be. But what I did understand was that there were a few songs on there where I was like, oh, this could be something. So flash forward to like a week later, I went back and I got drunk, not because I was thinking I'm going to get drunk and I'm going to enjoy this. We got drunk because I was like, fuck, I have to see this movie again uh, with my theater friends. And I've warned them that it's bad and they don't really believe me. So we're seeing it again. So I'm just going to get wasted. The movie was a revelation. <laughs> it was an absolute revelation. Oh my God. The lights, the lights go down for that opening number. And I was just like, I was in it. I was there. It was, it was suddenly, it was the greatest show. And I like, I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was because this theater was like filled with like families. Um, and there were like children enjoying it and parents enjoying it. And I just like, couldn't find it in me to be the cynical, like gross 20 something that I was at the time. I don't know like what it was, but it, hooked me. And not only was I like in it for the music, I didn't fucking care that it only took them like a week to get to England and back. I didn't care that I didn't know what time it, like what the date was. I, I didn't care that this dude seemingly kidnapped uh, several of the people in his circus. I didn't care about any of that anymore. Something just flipped in my brain um, and made me deeply love this film. I don't really know what was going on. It might've just been like the time period we were in. We were like a year post-election. Things were seeming a little grim. Um, and maybe I just wanted joy. And so I took the joy that was given to me. Three weeks later, I went on my birthday with my now husband and a few of our friends. And we went to the sing-along version that they released a few weeks later after that initial run, because at this point, like Fox kind of knew something was happening because um, you could see the box office numbers simply not slowing down. So they decided to release this, this uh, sing along version. And we went and it was a row of like six to eight of us adults, all of us with our box wine. Um, and then the row directly behind us was like a group of um, like a high school musical theater group. They knew every word, they knew all the choreography and were like performing the choreography, not only in the aisle behind us, but then like down the stairs of the, the aisles in the theater. And that was when I just really got it. I was like, oh, kids just love this shit. Because this was like kind of a weird period. Like you didn't have a continuous stream of musical theater coming out on a week to week basis as we had for a very long time with Glee. Like musical theater kids were living for a while and then Glee went away, thank God. And now we had like a few very popular things, but I think that the circus musical kind of just like tapped into this need for new theater content. It was theater made by musical theater people um, that was accessible for everyone. And these kids were eating it up. So it was just like really hard to be cynical about this thing that I had to admit to myself that not only I thought was very good <laughs> um, and then like seeing all of these other just like small musical theater children or performance children also really like it. I just couldn't be cynical anymore. I just had to embrace the circus musical into my heart. The Greatest Showman is a biopic. If you watch this channel, you're probably very familiar with the general structure of biopics. 
And this isn't much different. It begins in media res, with P.T. Barnum introducing the audience to his circus, and repeatedly proclaiming via song that this is the greatest show. And then the film slows down. He looks around, and it's clear that P.T. Barnum needs to think about his entire life before he puts on a circus. So we flash back to his childhood, and we see a young Barnum looking in the window of a store at a top hat. That's right. This is the inspiring story of a boy who always wanted a top hat, and how one day, he finally got to wear one. But seriously, it lays out the central thread of the movie. This poor kid wants what the hat represents. Success, fame, and glory, and we know from the opening scene that one day, he's gonna get it. See, you'd think this would be simple, but this movie is not simple. We learn here that he is the son of a tailor, and he falls in love with the daughter of one of their rich clients. They spend all their time together, they explore an abandoned old house, but the problem is, they're from two different worlds. So we understand what has to happen. Barnum needs to make a name for himself using his skills for tricks and showmanship to become a success and prove himself worthy of this girl. It's like the great Gatsby, but greater. The greatest Gatsby. She is sent away to finishing school, his father dies, but they write to each other every day. Finally, years later, they've grown up, and she leaves home and moves to New York City with Barnum, where they get married and have two daughters. Barnum loses his office job, but they don't give up their dreams. He wants to fill people with wonder, one of their daughters wants ballet slippers. Really, this whole family seems very obsessed with specific clothing items. So he opens a museum filled with oddities, but no one is coming to see it. It isn't working, and then he realizes that it needs life. He remembers how when he was a kid, a person with a facial deformity was kind to him, and realizes that these people shunned by society are actually amazing, and just need the right platform. So he brings them all together in a circus. It becomes a huge success. Barnum buys that old abandoned house they used to explore as kids. He even gets his daughter the ballet slippers. Everyone's dreams come true, and finally, he is the greatest showman. And that's the end of the story. Look out, cause here I come. Wait. Oh. Um, it turns out that's only the first 30 minutes of the movie. And that is exactly what is so strange about The Greatest Showman. It makes no damn sense. It compels me, though. There's a perfectly fine, inspiring, rags-to-riches story there that could easily fill a whole movie, but instead they decided to fit five movies into one. So if the first movie ends 30 minutes in, here's what comes next. Movie number two functions as a sequel to the first one. Now that Barnum has made all his dreams come true, he suddenly becomes obsessed with being viewed as legitimate and gaining critical respect. He doesn't care that everyone in the audience is having a great time. He cares about that one snooty critic with the glasses shaking his head dismissively. His daughter gets teased once because her dad owns a circus, and he vows never to let this happen again. His daughter actually gets over it immediately and never brings it up again. Literally only Barnum cares about this. His motivation here is, I'll show those little girls who's a legitimate businessman. So he ditches his family to take opera singer Jenny Lind on tour, and finally gets those good reviews he craved. But it turns out, She's an evil seductress and tries to lure him into an affair, but he says no. Then his wife leaves him, the circus burns down, and he's left with nothing. And this concludes the dark middle chapter. Movie number three, The Return of the Jedi of the Greatest Showman trilogy, really only makes up the last 13 minutes. This is where Barnum wins back his family, reopens the circus, but this time it's in a tent so it can travel the world. And then he retires to spend time with his family, so it basically becomes Jersey Girl. 
where he leaves his job to rush to his daughter's recital. And in case you're wondering, the three movies in the trilogy should be called The Good Showman, The Great Showman, and then The Greatest Showman. Okay, but now I want to talk about movie number four because this is actually the interesting one. See, when Barnum suddenly becomes obsessed with getting critical respect, he meets with Zac Efron and asks him to come on as a producer. Zac Efron comes from a rich, high-society family and likes to invest his money in the arts. He isn't really a fan of the circus, but he gets into it to make a profit. But then he falls in love with Zendaya, who is Michi, which is forbidden by society because she's black. He risks his life for her and almost dies. Over the course of the story, his perspective changes, and he gives up his old life to embrace his new one. In the end, Barnum gives him the top hat, and Zac Efron becomes the new greatest showman. This is the greatest show! And then... There's movie number five. This is the one about the actual circus performers. They're all outcasts, but then Barnum brings them together and gives them a home and a place to be themselves. And that's the story. There are some protesters who don't like them. And there's one scene where they fight those protesters and use their abilities like they're the X-Men. The protesters get arrested off screen and are never seen again. And so this brings us to the problem with The Greatest Showman. It needed to pick one of those movies to be. Maybe even two of them, but not all five. By cramming so much into just over 90 minutes, the parts that should be important end up getting neglected. Barnum's story is complete 30 minutes in. The circus performers end up neglected because there isn't room for them to have an actual story. Poor Michelle Williams is stuck standing on the sidelines doing nothing because all of her character development happened in a three-minute montage. At least in Venom, she got to hang out with Tom Hardy in a lobster tank. Wow, this movie paints Jenny Lind in such a bad light. She never tried to seduce Barnum. She quit because he was a dick and gave all her money from the tour to charity. Zac Efron's character is completely made up. This movie is like the opposite of what really happened. Of course Pat would be obsessed with it. It's just like his videos. I wish. We haven't had a single baby elephant yet. No, it's that Pat seems like this adorable movie nerd, but really he's using all of us just for his personal gain. Like Chloe, he's Barnum, and we're the circus freaks. Which circus freak are you? I think I'm the Irish giant, and you're probably... Dog boy. <laughs> Jake, are, are you paying attention? Jake! Sorry, sorry. Were you obsessing about Charles again? Usually you'd be right, but no. Uh, I just have This Is Me stuck in my head again. That song fucking slaps. So catchy. Anyway, back to Dog Boy. This is where we need to talk about This Is Me. This is me, look out, this here I go. The big hit single that won all the awards, because it manages to encapsulate all, or at least most of, the weird problems with this movie. The whole Greatest Showman soundtrack, written by Pasek and Paul, was a big deal. But This Is Me was by far the standout song. This is the one that won a Golden Globe and charted the highest on the Billboard Top 100. It's a big, triumphant number sung by the bearded lady, whose name I think is Letty, alongside the rest of the oddities, as they're called. So my question is, what narrative function does it serve? This is what Bob Fosse referred to as an I Am song a song in which a character presents who they are and how they feel in that moment. Like Jet's song in West Side Story, or Gaston from Beauty and the Beast, or every song from Cats. It's an empowerment anthem, a big triumphant song about accepting who you are and stepping out into the world with pride. So in other words, it functions a lot like Let It Go from Frozen. In Let It Go, Elsa is leaving her old life behind and accepting who she is. And by the end of the song, she's made a literal physical transformation. It's a major turning point in her character arc and for the overall story. And technically, it's more of an I Am Becoming song than an I Am song, but they're pretty similar. This Is Me is supposedly about the same ideas. 
The circus performers stepping out of the darkness into the light, letting everyone see who they are and not being ashamed. So it would make a ton of sense if this was the song they sing before their very first performance in the circus, when they're revealing themselves to the world for the first time and overcoming their fears. But it's not that song. That song is Come Alive, and it's sung from Barnum's perspective about how excited he is to open a circus. Instead, This Is Me comes after the performers have been doing successful shows at the circus for months. It comes after they already went to England to meet Queen Victoria, who loved them. The entire motivation for the song is just that Barnum won't let them go to a party. And This Is Me doesn't mark any change in the characters or story. The bearded lady sings this huge empowering song, and in the very next scene, Barnum is ignoring her. Actually, he only says one line to her in the entire rest of the movie. You brought joy into my life. Into all our lives. Here, here. Bunny the Bank would take joyous collateral. The song is about her stepping into the spotlight, and then for the rest of the movie, she's shoved into the background. And most of the other performers in the song don't even have names, let alone any dialogue. Like, I don't know who this guy is. Or this guy. Or her. Or them. Or him. Near the end of the number, the world slows down around the bearded lady, putting us in her perspective, similar to what it does with Barnum at the beginning of the movie. It's like the film is telling us it's her story, but it's really not. This Is Me feels like a big climactic emotional moment, but it comes out of nowhere and ultimately doesn't mean anything. It's like they wrote a song and couldn't find anywhere else to put it, so they just made up an excuse. And look, lots of musicals have good songs that have nothing to do with the story. But this isn't G. Officer Krupke. It's the emotional centerpiece of the movie. And it's kind of weird to have your big centerpiece be an empowerment anthem sung by the marginalized characters, who the movie then marginalizes for the rest of the running time. But there is one part of the number that does actually feel like it matters in the greater story. It's brief, but there's a moment when Zendaya and Zac Efron make eye contact as she sings the line, This is me. See, a few minutes earlier, they held hands, and then his parents looked at them disapprovingly, and he broke away. And here you can see her frustration at him not wanting to be seen with her. See, their relationship is the only thing that feels like a real relationship in the movie. Hugh Jackman and Michelle Williams fall in love, grow up, and get married in the span of one musical montage. But Efron and Zendaya getting together actually takes time and feels earned. And this is where I realized some important lessons about The Greatest Showman. The best version of this movie is about Zac Efron's character, who is a totally fictional character created for the movie, so really, the movie shouldn't be about P.T. Barnum at all. See, Barnum isn't actually a very interesting character. He's just presented as a saint-like man who only wants to make everyone happy. But Efron's character actually has a real arc. He starts as a rich high society guy who only gets into the circus business to make money. And then he has his worldview challenged. He becomes open-minded and chooses to leave his old life behind. He gives up his inheritance. He actually spends time with the performers and gets to know them, even falling in love with one. And he has the only two songs that actually matter to the story. The other side, in which Barnum convinces him to join the circus, and rewrite the stars, the love duet with him and Zendaya. Most of the songs in the movie are catchy but empty inspirational pop songs, but these ones feel like a real extension of the characters and move the story forward. And the other option that would have worked is to just stick with movie number one. Forget Jenny Lind, forget about Efron, just make it about Barnum opening the circus and his relationship with the performers. So combining movie one and movie five. I don't know who these notes are actually for since the movie came out three years ago and was a huge hit, but 
There you go. A good traditional Hollywood movie is usually built around one central theme or idea. So like Paddington 2, the theme is love thy neighbor. But the circus musical has, by my count, four central themes. They are believe in your dreams, be proud of what makes you unique, bring joy to other people, and family is the most important thing there is. Because the movie pushes all these themes equally, they all end up running together, and in the end, instead of any one of them sticking with us, the main idea the movie gives us is just that P.T. Barnum was the most wonderful man who ever lived. It's kind of like a propaganda film made by the Barnum estate. But this is exactly what makes the movie so fascinating to me. The way it tries to be absolutely everything at once. I got a hold of a draft of the screenplay dated April 2015. This draft is credited to writer Michael Arndt, revising an earlier draft by Jenny Bix and Bill Condon. All the press about the movie when it was starting production in 2016 credit Arndt as the writer, but the final film only credits Bix and Condon. Comparing this draft to the finished film, it's clear that at some point between this being written and the film being finished, it got hacked down to the bone. Pretty much all the scenes and dialogue in the film are in the script, but then there's also just much more. Like early on in the script, there are three full dialogue scenes featuring Barnum as a child. In the final movie, Barnum as a child only has three lines of dialogue. It's my fault, sir. I made her laugh. How'd you get out? I do. This is a movie that passed through at least five writers that I'm aware of, and as previously mentioned, there are six credited film editors, which is way more than an average movie. Also, late in production, James Mangold, director of Logan, was paid a seven-figure salary to supervise reshoots and ended up with an executive producer credit on the movie. Now, none of this is bad. Filmmaking, especially on this scale, is always complicated and usually kind of messy. What I find so interesting about this movie is how it passed through so many hands, with so much being stuffed into it and simultaneously being cut out. The 2015 version of the script has the same problems, but also has much more breathing room to flesh out the characters. And the choice was made to strip all of that out for the sake of brutal efficiency and maximum sensation. A more traditional, maybe better, version of this movie would end with the circus becoming a success and Barnum finally making his and his family's dreams come true. But The Greatest Showman gives the audience that payoff and catharsis only 30 minutes in. In this movie, scenes rarely last for more than a minute. There is this near-constant rhythmic percussion, whether from characters hammering nails or the score itself. It's relentlessly moving forward. Several of the songs, like A Million Dreams, A Million Dreams Reprise, Come Alive, and Tightrope, are presented as montage sequences instead of regular scenes. Weeks or months or years pass in the span of a single song. It has the strange effect of making the entire movie feel like a 105-minute montage. Or another way to look at it is that the whole movie feels like a really long trailer for itself. I've spent a lot of time here analyzing what could be called flaws or problems with the circus musical, but this is the last video of the year, and I don't want to end this on a negative note. Three years ago, when the movie became a surprise phenomenon, a lot of critics were baffled by the deep, passionate love that audiences seemed to have for this movie. New York Times writer Stephanie Goodman was so mystified that she asked readers to write in explaining why they loved the weird circus musical. And now, after studying it more than any person really should, I think I have a better idea. This is a movie that is so desperate to entertain that it exists at all times at an emotional peak while also throwing as much sensation at you as possible. There are no quiet songs or boring songs. Well, okay, Tightrope is boring. But every other song is a foot-stomping, hand-clapping, epic, triumphant anthem with so many whoa's that you think for a second that 
the band Fun actually made another album. Seamus McGarvey's cinematography creates this absurd, colorful fantasy world that does kind of feel like an updated version of that polished artifice that was so appealing about the old MGM musicals. Like, when Barnum takes the train to what I think is Long Island, it looks like he's visiting Middle Earth or something. It's ridiculous. This movie is, essentially, a perfect representation of the experience of watching a circus. Every minute there's some bright new thing happening to distract you from whatever you were just looking at. It's pure spectacle and sensation that is designed for maximum entertainment value, and you really should not think too hard about it. Wait, is this movie actually a secret masterpiece? Or is it a sinister attempt to cynically package inspirational sentiments and messages about acceptance inside an ultimately hollow product? Who can say? This is why alcohol helps. See, when you're drunk, you don't think about the lack of emotional logic connecting one event to the next. You don't think about how the climactic decision to reopen the circus in a tent comes out of nowhere, but it functions like a dramatic payoff as if the tent had been set up in Act 1, or how Barnum triumphantly reopens the circus and then immediately decides to leave and give his job to Zac Efron. And then he rides an elephant to his daughter's ballet recital and his family is waiting outside for him. But leaving the circus was a spontaneous decision, so how did they know he was coming? Look, we here at the Patrick H. Willems channel are good role models and do not advocate unhealthy behavior. But I will say that when you're drunk, none of this stuff matters, because all you're thinking is, Whoa! Zac Efron has the hat! Now he's dancing! Look, there's an elephant! Woo! Do I think The Greatest Showman is good? No. Do I like it? I don't think so. But I have to admit that when you're with the right people, and you've had enough drinks, it's hard not to get a little swept up in it. When Efron puts on the top hat and does that genuinely transcendent spinning slide on his knees as he proclaims this is the greatest show, this is the greatest show. I can't deny it. Like, let's just watch it again right now. This is the greatest show. It's so good. Like right here, the sheer concussive dumbness and energy and yeah, I'll say it, craft is kind of overwhelming. And look, I have to respect a movie that ends by repeatedly shouting at you about how great a show it is. It's not the best movie, it's not even really a good movie, but it is the most movie. Okay, wait, one last thing. Why does this movie show the 20th Century Fox logo twice at the beginning? It uses an old-fashioned one from the 60s, and then a modern CGI one over the opening song, and I just don't get it. Jake, Chloe, we just wrapped the last video of the year, and most importantly, our star meter rankings have gone up. Jake, you're up to 1,796,000. Is that good? It could be better. I brought you both out here to share with me this inspiring vista of our beautiful city. Do you feel as inspired as I do? <sighs> to a great year, and another one just like it. Pat, 2020 has been terrible. I wouldn't wish another year like this on anyone. But we gained a thousand new subscribers. Wow, a full thousand? That's not a lot. And in Q4, our audience retention metrics have been steadily trending upwards. I don't know what that means, but it sounds great. This year, we've been good showmen. But next year, we'll be the greatest showmen. Here. These will be deducted from your paycheck, so you each owe me $10. Cute as shit. Charles is the key to our success. Charles is the key to our success. Are you okay? Chloe, you know, I've been so obsessed with this coconut that I've forgotten that what I'm really upset about is that I'm losing my old friend. 
You know, Patrick's been so focused on views and clicks and star meters. And I swear it's this fucking coconut who's poisoning his mind with some kind of t telepathic hypnosis or, 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 or maybe- or, or maybe it's something simpler than that. Like Patrick is just focused on his career. Sometimes friends have different priorities and they grow apart. There doesn't have to be some sinister plot behind it all. Happy holidays. You know, I was wondering when you were going to show up. It looks like you and me are going to have to have a little conversation, huh? I've been traveling for days through the wilderness to tell you something very important. See, this show that you're watching here on YouTube, it seems like the greatest show, but really, there's a greater version of it. There's a version where the visuals are better because you don't have YouTube's compression degrading the video quality. You don't have to sit through any ads, you know, like this one. You get the real director's cuts of the videos, and that's on Nebula. It's a platform that I helped build along with a ton of, in my opinion, the best creators on YouTube. It's a place where we can make what we want and be ourselves and say, this is me, without worrying about the algorithm or demonetization. It's where we can make different kinds of original productions, because once that vaccine hits, we're finally, finally gonna shoot that short film that we were supposed to shoot back in the spring, and where's it gonna premiere? That's right, on Nebula. This is all possible because we've partnered with Curiosity Stream, a streaming platform that's home to thousands of great documentaries. There's even one about the real story behind one of the characters in The Greatest Showman, so you can see what the movie left out. And we've worked out a deal. You could even call it the greatest deal, where if you sign up for Curiosity Stream, you get a Nebula subscription for free. And right now, we have a special holiday discount with 41% off of annual plans. This way, you can support channels like this one and get so much great stuff to watch while you're stuck inside this winter. So go on, come alive and rewrite the stars and make a million dreams come true with Nebula and Curiosity Stream. This is not the official slogan, I'm just trying to tie it into the video somehow. I should get inside, it's really cold out here. We did it, we're here. We reached the end of a full year of videos. Thank you so much for sticking with us through all of this. And now since it's Christmas, it seems like an appropriate time to credit and thank some people who I could not have done this without. For this video, first and foremost, uh, Brian Metolius, our composer who made the entire song. I can't believe this worked. Brian, you're a genius. I owe you forever. Uh, of course, Jake and Chloe, who had so much to do in this video, whether it was recording vocals or shooting scenes remotely by themselves, they're amazing. It worked. I love them. I love working with them. Mike, of course, who wrote the narrative for this video with Jake and I, uh, and, and has been such a vital part of this operation all year. The whole team, really, like Matt as well. Uh, I could not have done any of this without them. I relied on them so much this year. They're all great. I love working with them. Um, Rachel, the heart and soul of the talk show band. My parents, for their eternal patience when I was stuck here for half the year. This is really sounding like an acceptance speech, but I haven't won anything. Uh, Dave, 
for everything. The TCM Wine Club, <sighs> love you. Uh, and of course, just everyone who like supports this channel and this weird operation that we've got going on here. This has been a, a bad nightmare year and I realize what a fortunate position I'm in to be able to keep doing what I'm doing. And, uh, and I really appreciate that, whether you would join the Patreon or just watch the videos, whatever, it all means a lot to me. So thank you. This is getting very sentimental now. So I'm just gonna say, have a Merry Christmas. Please stay safe. And I'm gonna go take uh, a break because I really need one. And I'm gonna try to relax and we'll be back in early 2021 as we reach the end game of this whole season we've been doing. That's it, bye.